or send an email to webinar at cbinsights.com and we'll do our best to help. But again, we'll send everything out afterwards, so don't worry too much. Okay, so as of with all of our webinars, we'll be moving through a lot of data and insights and doing it pretty quickly, but we also want to make sure that we're answering your questions and keeping this relevant. So throughout the webinar, feel free to ask us questions using the questions tab within GoToWebinar or via Twitter using the hashtag CBIHealth. And of course, we're CB Insights. Okay, with that, let's introduce Nikhil and get started on the content. Nikhil is a research industry analyst here at CB Insights and is focused on healthcare, consumer packaged goods, and more. His re research has been published in dozens of publications, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Bloomberg, and others that you can see right there. He is also a graduate from Columbia University. All right, Nikhil, take it away. Thanks for the introduction, Riley, and thank you guys for joining me today. Today I'll be talking about healthcare 2.0. Um, there are definitely many different eras of healthcare, but I call this 2.0 as the first truly digital overhaul that's happened in the industry, and I'll talk about what's happening and who the major players are. First, a little bit about CB Insights. We're a National Science Foundation-backed company that uses data science and machine learning to help people better understand private markets, whether that's companies they should be selling to, um, acquiring or investing, people they should be partnering with, or where their competition is moving. We're used by some of the biggest names in the industry, including Cisco, Salesforce, Castrol, and a whole host of others that you can see on our site. Our mantra is, in God we trust, all others must bring data. We strive to make sure our observations and research are grounded in data instead of some of the punditry that you might hear in other parts of the industry. So what are we going to be talking about today? Healthcare is a huge space, uh, and I'm really just going to be drilling down into what's happening in the delivery of care and products, aka things that touch patients more directly, and how tech is changing that landscape and completely overhauling some of the processes. I'll be talking a little less about data generation and storage, um, since I talked about that in my last digital health webinar, which you can find on the CB Insights website. I'll start by talking about some of the more macro level changes in the healthcare industry that are enabling the overhaul that's happening today, and then I'll jump into the activity happening in private markets. The processes I'll be focusing on will be primary care, and in general, the first point of contact that we have the healthcare system, insurance and who's paying for healthcare, and then pharmaceuticals from the drug distribution side of things. I'll wrap up by talking about a few emerging technologies that I think are interesting. Um, and just a heads up, there's a lot of material in this deck that I might move through relatively quickly, but as we said in the beginning, uh, you're all going to be receiving the slides and recording if you'd like to review them later. So let's begin with the macro level trends, which are things that are going to come up over and over again in this webinar. For those of you that don't know, two crucial acts spurred the change in healthcare uh, that we're seeing today. The High Tech Act, which began the process of digitizing our health data, and the ACA, which, among other things, was a step to shifting from a fee-for-service system, which incentivized more testing, to a fee-for-value system, which rewarded keeping patients out of hospitals. These shifts are important today because healthcare costs continue to soar, which should be no surprises to anyone who's been reading any of the recent newspaper headlines. And despite the fact that we're seeing a significant slowdown of growth in healthcare expenditure, it still vastly outpaces normal inflation. A large growth in expenditure has been rooted in prescription drugs in recent years, which you might have seen with uh, the introduction of controversial drug pricing stories like the new hepatitis C drugs that have come out. Um, and it's also been a particular point of focus in this election cycle. Now, who's bearing the brunt of these healthcare costs? Both employers and employees are continuously having to spend more on healthcare, though employers pay a much larger portion themselves. However, growth in employer costs has slowed, largely in part because they're shifting a lot of the costs to employees who are taking a lot more high deductible health plans. And the, the de average deductible itself continues to grow, passing $1,000 in 2012, and that's putting a lot more strain on individuals. Nearly two-thirds of people surveyed by Nielsen uh, said they'd be concerned about how to pay for their medical treatment, 
and ones that are already saddled with some form of medical debt. Those are just some of the stats that um, sort of underlie the driving healthcare changes. And as I talk through the rest of the webinar, a few themes are gonna pop out that span across all the different moving parts. The first is the consumerization of healthcare. In the new system, patients are supposed to be empowered to make more choices themselves um, through things like comparison shopping and other initiatives. And we're seeing more companies which are targeting the patients themselves, many of which are entirely bypassing the existing legacy infrastructure of hospitals and they're building their own processes and data sets. Mobile phones play a huge role in this since they play a huge role in our regular daily lives. Um, and they also add an important dynamic to care, which is location. Plus, mobile, mobile formats reward simplicity, and that's provide a lot of opportunities for many new mobile-optimized healthcare startups. We'll, go th we'll look through a lot of these companies um, throughout the webinar, but mobile is playing a huge role in everything from fertility tracking to appointment scheduling. And also, mobile phones have the computing power to do a lot of the tests remotely that you previously needed to go to a hospital to do. This trend is pervasive in tech, but healthcare is now seeing many companies who are removing the brick and mortar aspect of their businesses, which allows them to scale up care and scale down cost. There have been many recent headlines recently about mega mergers and consolidation in healthcare. Essentially, larger companies are claiming that they can reduce the cost of care through mergers and then pass those savings on to consumers. Um, but the FTC has said otherwise and scrutinized several mergers, like the Pfizer Allergen merger, which ended up falling through due to tax reasons, and scrutiny over Anthem Cigna and Aetna Humana in the health insurance uh, world. That kind of consolidation at the top has produced a lot of giants in the healthcare business, but it's also made room for smaller companies to take advantage by offering an alternative to consumers through narrow networks, which essentially is reducing care to a select few choices, but therefore reducing the costs and then speeding up the process. Many new companies that are popping up are also internalizing a lot of the functions into these narrow networks, um, and they make their operation more verticalized. So, um, instead of having to spend time negotiating with different players, which also ends up increasing the cost of care, um, they're able to do most of the things themselves in-house. And finally, we're seeing more of a categorization system for care with the one-size-fits-all approach not working anymore. Tech allows patients to be sorted into different levels of care based on severity, and now there are more options that are being provided which are cheaper um, than the existing alternatives. Let's start where a lot of the startup activity is happening, which is taking advantage of some of the trends that I just went through, and that's in private markets. Hype around the digital health space has not abated. I used uh, CBI's trends analysis, which takes a look at news chatter and what people are talking about, and the pace just continues to increase. That being said, exits in the space have slowed in 2016, though increased steadily between 2012 and 2015. There have been a few blockbuster hits, um, few and far between, but some of the big ones have been Fitbit and Castlight Health, both of which had had uh, billion dollar plus IPOs, but then saw corrections in public markets. Funding also saw a significant drop off in Q2, falling below 200 deals for the first time since Q4-14. The space has escalated in activity since 2012 as a whole, with Q2-16 representing the first significant drop in a while. Funding, however, has remained healthy, which suggests uh, large deals into a few companies, including Spring Rain Software and Clover Health this past quarter. Early stage deal share has dropped since 2012, which saw a lot of excitement in the space. Deal share has normalized slightly since then, with more mature companies taking later stage deals and more scrutiny towards uh, younger companies. California has seen most of the deal activity in the past quarter, though more than 50 deals happen internationally, especially in Asia. Outside of the more typical markets, Missouri and Florida had quite a bit of deal activity with seven deals apiece in Q2-16. And more investors continue to see opportunity in this space with more than 1,300 unique investors who made at least one deal into a digital health company in 2015. 2016 has already seen more than 800 unique investors in the first half of this year. 
When we look at the most active VC investors, Rock Health stands out as having the most unique investments since 2014. There are several corporate venture arms high up in this space, like Qualcomm, who's been particularly, particularly active in the wearable space, um, and Google Ventures and GE Ventures as well. A look at all active investors in the digital health space shows how important accelerators are um, in this area, with the top three most active all being accelerators. Y Combinator, which is typically you know, a more generalist uh, accelerator, has seen a lot more digital health companies go through its program. A lot of the companies that are being funded in private markets are operating in the area where consumers first touch the healthcare system, which is typically primary care. Primary care has been and still is one of the most part, important parts of the healthcare systems because it funnels and directs people into the rest of the system. However, as boomers start aging, an interest in primary care among med students slows down due to low pay and relatively monotonous cases, among other reasons. Um, we're going to be seeing a shortage in the area in the near future, which is why we need tools to increase the number of people receiving care. This is especially important because people who live in rural areas or are unable to easily leave their homes due to illness uh, have a hard time finding adequate care. And when people don't see primary care physicians, they have a higher likelihood to end up in more expensive hospitalizations later, um, which you can see um, in the findings across many different studies. Understanding the need primary care plays in the healthcare system, and also that primary care is a lot more than just seeing your doctor uh, once every so often to get a shot, we're moving more towards a holistic view of primary care called patient-centered medical homes. And just to clarify, a medical home isn't actually a physical place. It's actually a model of delivering care which puts patients at the center of care and includes understanding what's happening to these patients outside of the hospital and coordinating care amongst a bunch of different stakeholders from uh, mental health professionals to specialists to social workers. And this also put a bigger emphasis on digital tools to enable that kind of collaboration. For anyone curious, the term medical home was coined in the 60s and was more centered around um, coordinating a family around care closer to the home itself. But the definition has changed a lot over time. When we start integrating digital tools and understanding that primary care is actually a lot of different functions, we start to see an explosion of companies that are effectively unbundling the different functions which primary care once served. So everything from consumer diagnostics to urgent care which I'll dive deeper into. And I'll start with consumer diagnostics. The market for these diagnostic tests is projected to keep growing, and smartphones have provided the computing power to do many of these tests at home. And there are some clear uh, benefits to doing putting diagnostic tests in the hands of patients. For one, the sheer number of data points taken is going to increase, and that can help avoid uh, mismeasurement and flukes that happen just by taking one data point. And measurements can be taken at a variety of times instead of only at the hospital. So, for example, at night or directly after meals. And anomalies can be caught earlier. So that way we can take better measures to ensure a healthy outcome for the patient. We're seeing financing into some private companies that do this, like conducting ECGs through mobile phones and uh, monitoring hor hormone levels using do-it-yourself kits. So in the future, when your physician asks to see certain biomarkers, uh, you'll be able to do lots of them from home. When it comes to testing, a relatively recent major development are retail clinics, which are set up in traditional groceries and pharmacies, um, like the Minute Clinics and CVS stores, where we can get a variety of tests done, like STDs or different type of cultures. And the number of these retail clinics has continued to rise rapidly across most major retail pharmacy change, uh, with CVS leading the way. Uh, if you haven't been to a pharmacy recently, uh, next time you go, keep a lookout for these clinics because uh, more and more of them are popping up every day. And this is an important development because it means you don't need to go to your primary care physician for the purpose of getting basic tests done. And the wait time for retail clinics is significantly shorter. Retail clinics and pharmacies aren't the only development on the brick and mortar side of things. You may have noticed a rise in urgent care clinics. In New York, it seems like there's a new city MD every time I look around. And for those of you that don't know, urgent care clinics are walk-in clinics for non-threatening conditions, but that need to be seen within a relatively close time period. They're also very useful because they operate outside of the typical primary care hours, like later at night or during the weekends. 
This development is critical because urgent care fills an important gap between primary care, which can take a long time to get an appointment, and the ER, which is incredibly expensive. We can see in this table how much cheaper certain types of urgent care visits are compared to their counterparts in the ER. Treating a sore throat, for example, is five times more expensive in the ER. Concierge medicine is the last brick and mortar development I'll talk about, but it represents a very new model of what primary care looks like. People that use concierge medicine pay an annual subscription fee and generally more out-of-pocket expenditures, uh, although it depends on which network you're a part of, um, and then they go to a narrow network of locations, but they also receive higher quality primary care. One Medical is one of the more popular names in this space, um, and they're a good example of what a new primary care practice looks like when it's built from the ground up. So far, the company has raised more than $180 million from Benchmark, Red Mile Group, and several other investors, and charges uh, $199 for a subscription to their service. Like I said um, before, they use the narrow networks method, and what's interesting about One Medical in particular is that they've actually built their own EMR and have their own on-site lab testing, which helps them reduce result times significantly, and it's an example of the verticalization and uh, bringing processes in-house trend that I talked about at the beginning of the webinar. A big value add is that the company uh, talks about the suite of digital tools that they offer, including patient portal, telemedicine features, uh, and scheduling all through a single app. There are several companies that are using this consumer-friendly subscription model to change primary care, including Zoom, which offers emergency care as well, and Iora Health. What I think is one of the more interesting features of One Medical is not just the direct-to-consumer model, but they also work with employers to offer plans for their employees. Access to One Medical is not just offered as a benefit, but they'll also come and do uh, on-site biometric screenings and other necessities that'll help uh, the employers monitor their employee health. And for employers that are large enough, they'll actually come and set up an on-site clinic for people to access. On their website, they have several case studies showing how they decrease ER visits by providing this kind of primary care access to employees. This is important because more employers are planning to expand the on-site services that they offer to employees within the next two years. Proactively getting employees to take care of their health and removing the friction to see a primary care physician makes it more likely for them to get regular checkups, and it's a great uh, benefit to offer in terms of recruiting. I showed this slide before, but I think it's worth reiterating um, that with employer share of healthcare costs being so high, employers are trying as many ways as possible to reduce uh, expensive hospitalizations. And even beyond that, sick employees result in productivity loss for the company as a whole. Like we see in this analysis by Gallup, which estimates that more than $153 billion are lost in productivity from sick days. And that's one of the reasons that we're seeing more startups which offer services to employers to help get their employees access to care when they need it. QLiance is uh, setting up on-site clinics for large employers, while companies like Sherpa are going through the more telehealth approach by offering full-time physicians that can monitor employee health and guide them to the appropriate and most cost-effective path through the healthcare system. Which brings me to the last branch of primary care unbundling that I'm going to talk about today, which is telemedicine. And that's defined as digital tools and services designed to change, exchange medical information. And it's been a term that's been thrown around in healthcare for uh, several decades now with the definition changing from time to time. These tools are critical because not only do they help people in rural areas who might not have easy to access to healthcare or primary care physicians like we talked about before, or people who find moving around very difficult, um, but there's actually a lot of use case for people with chronic disease, which represents a disproportionately large amount of healthcare expenditure. And chronic disease can be mitigated or managed better with behavioral changes and remote monitoring, which is ideal for telemedicine approaches. This has been beneficial, especially in older populations, which are more affected by chronic disease and generally have more access issues to care. Several studies have found a significant decrease in hospitalizations for nursing homes that actively uh, engage in telemedicine. These, tele these telehealth services are really important because one, as we talked about before, they give access, um, they give care to people who might have access issues. Two, they reduce the friction of actually receiving care, which makes it easier for people who may not have actually taken the time to go see a doctor in a clinic 
either because they're very busy or unsure if they needed to. So it really helps push people that are on the fence about getting care. And in many ca and three, in many cases, it creates a, a referenceable record of what was said. So when you visit a doctor at a practice, the information is generally exchanged verbally, and many patients and doctors end up, end up forgetting parts of it later. Telehealth creates a record of these conversations, which can refer, be referred back to later. And four, it creates data by turning conversations, especially texts, into data that can be mined in many cases, like doing sentiment analysis. And this space continues to get more competitive. I put a few telemedicine companies in our compare companies tool to see how they're performing. And many of these companies have raised lots of money to compete with each other. And almost all of them haven't raised in about a year, which means most likely a lot of them are planning to raise relatively soon. Out of the bunch, American Well seems to be performing pretty well according to our Mosaic score, um, which is essentially how we calculate company health. And the companies also raised the most money of the four with 140 million total raised. Teladoc, which was one of the first movers in the space and also one of the bigger health, digital health exits, controls more than 65% of the market share in telemedicine according to a recent study. It's also one of the bigger exits in the digital health space. I took this snapshot from their CB Insights profile, and they raised um, more than $85 million before going public for a market cap of $703 million in July of 2015. The company also continues to facilitate more visits with more than 575,000 happening in 2015, which represented a 92% year-over-year increase. The use of telemedicine has given rise to several startups which provide coaching services to monitor patients outside of the hospital. This is especially important because now that we're prior prioritizing population health more aggressively, having additional monitoring for those that are more sick is a significant effort in reducing overall healthcare cost. As I mentioned before, chronic disease is a huge factor in this, which is why companies like Omada Health, which helps manage diabetes, have become really important. We're also seeing more telemedicine use cases for mental and emotional health as well, such as Lantern. One of the critical parts of telemedicine is that it can actually increase the output per doctor. It's important to remember that labor costs are still the highest expenditure in the healthcare industry, so scaling down the cost of service is critical. Some companies like Lemonade Health are using mobile and web portals to make communication between doctors and patients asynchronous. So in this case, you'd log into the app, fill out standard questions that a doctor would ask you in a visit, and then in a short period of time, the doctor will approve your prescription. So by removing that in-person aspect of the transaction, doctors can see a lot more patients without actually seeing them in a much shorter amount of time. And then that scales down the cost of the service itself. So uh, Lemonade charges a flat rate of $15 for a wider variety of tests from UTI medications to birth control to male pattern baldness. And $15 makes the service relatively out-of-pocket affordable. And in many cases, that lets a person bypass health insurance as a whole. While the company currently offers services for care that have been proven to be equally effective without seeing the patient, and there are typically more immediate use cases like flu, um, they also have plans to work closer with drugstore chains in the future to better manage longer-term health conditions, which can also be monitored more regularly without seeing patients in person all the time. So while telemedicine, telemedicine presents a good case for what the future of medicine might look like, it still begs the question of who's going to pay for it. Like I've said, many telemedicine companies are going straight to employers, especially self-insured ones, which we'll talk about in a second, and proving that they can reduce employee health care costs. And in many states, public and private insurance reimburses some form of telemedicine services. Even though Medicare reimbursement has been relatively low so far, a big recent step has been Medicare's reimbursement of diabetes coaching and prevention, where Omada has played a big role. Here, Sylvia Burwell, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, talks about how these tools can keep people healthy and reduce costs. So we can expect more uh, proven preventive models and then see some type of reimbursement for them in the future. When it comes to understanding payment and reimbursement, knowing where private insurance fits into this model is critical. So in this next section, we'll talk about the role health insurers are playing and threats to their industry. Health insurance companies are becoming more interested in digital tools 
since they see it as a way to reduce hospitalizations, especially in some of their more vulnerable populations. Blue Cross and Blue Shield has made several moves in regards to reimbursing uh, certain telemedicine capabilities. But they aren't the only ones. In fact, most major health insurers have partnered with at least one startup to provide these kind of services. I looked into our, uh, our partnership data in the CBI database and just took a select few. Um, this isn't all the partnerships. In fact, um, some of these carriers have multiple options for their cu customers. Um, but this just gives you an idea of how important insurers see this space. While some of the larger and more legacy insurance companies have begun to adopt digital tools, entirely new insurance companies are raising funds to incorporate them into their plans from the get-go. Clover and Oscar are some of the more well-funded ones, um, while somewhat stealthy Bright Health raised an $80 million Series A earlier this year. Oscar is the most well-known and most well-funded of these insurance startups, having raised more than $700 million, including $400 million just earlier this year. The company has refocused its strategy to optimize for narrow networks of coverage and use digital tools like telemedicine and an app that helps you find medicines in the cheapest way to reduce the cost of care. Actually, earlier today, a couple hours ago, Oscar just announced that they're going to be cu uh, cutting their provider network in half um, as a means to better control the care process, which sort of fits more into the verticalization trend um, and their general strategy, as we talked about. And another interesting development when we look at their hiring page suggests that they might be opening up their own clinic, which falls, again, into the verticalization trends and let them control and reduce costs. In that same vein, CEO Mario Schlosser mentioned at our future fintech conference that Oscar considers themselves a full stack insurance company, keeping most processes in-house, like claims processing and utilization management, things that are outsourced in some of the larger players. The company has had some questionable success opening in new markets like California, and they've planned to raise their premiums, but health insurance is a long game, especially when the ACA and health exchanges are still a very new concept. Um, while some startups see uh, opportunity in starting entirely new insurance carriers, others see opportunities in working with self-insured employers. For those of you that don't know, self-insurance is when companies assume the financial risk of their employees' health instead of paying a third-party insurance company to do so. So a lot of the larger employers who have a much uh, have their risk pool spread out across a lot of employees find it beneficial. We see in this chart that even small companies are increasing their rate of self-insurance as premiums for third-party insurance carriers grow higher and higher. This poses a threat to the health insurance companies if this trend continues. A somewhat recent development is an alliance of 20 large uh, employers banding together to use their combined employee pools to negotiate directly with providers and pharmacies to provide better and cheaper care to their employees and avoid insurance companies entirely. And so when we look at the functions that insurance provides as a whole, we understand what companies need to do if they were to bypass insurance. And this is where plenty of startups are seeing opportunity providing the individual services and guidance that insurance companies typically provided. Because employers are managing the risk themselves, they have a much higher incentive to have a hand in the health of their employees, which is why we see so many startups appealing to employers as a business model, like we've talked about throughout this presentation. Companies like Red Brick Health uh, provide tools to manage employee health and wellness, while 2020 provides on-site optometry for employers and their employees. What's also interesting is that while large employers typically had the bigger employee pools, which is what allowed them to negotiate, new companies are using tech to essentially bundle the employee pools of a lot of smaller companies and then leverage their collective negotiating power to reduce prices on certain services, which is what the aptly named Collective Health does. And the idea of collective negotiation extends past just employers and also works for consumers. Blink Health does this by aggregating the negotiating powers of its members without the insurance overhead. The company works only in generics, but charges less than, 10, less than $10 copay than most insurance companies require, which is typically how those insurance companies offset the cost of the much more expensive branded drugs. They've partnered with MedImpact, a pharmaceutical benefits manager, to do this and offer transparency and comparison uh, shopping tools to help customers drive down their medication cost. Blink Health is just one company that's operating in the medication space. 
In the next section, we're going to talk a little bit about other companies that are trying to reduce medication expenditure and also make it easier for us to get our meds. I had this slide earlier, but just to reiterate why this is important, prescription drug costs have become a big issue as prices continue to spike. A lot of these spikes are rooted in brand name drugs, however, most prescriptions nowadays are actually written for generic versions. Consumers now have more choice in their medications, and that's become an opportunity that many startups see. These are companies that are using comparison shopping tools to let consumers find the cheapest medication for their needs. We talked about Blink Health, but several other companies like GoodRx and Oration are also operating here. Like many of the other digital tools that we're talking about today, um, a lot of the comparison sites are appealing to employers to get them on board in reducing expenditure and medications um, among their employees. Oration posts the results of this case study on their site, and you can see that they're targeting self-insured companies like we've been talking about. However, the effectiveness of consumer shopping tools has been met with skeptics. A recent study found no association with lower healthcare expenditure, mostly because very few people actually ended up using the tool. It is worth noting that the study only looked at two large companies, so further research probably needs to be done. The proliferation of comparison tools and the spotlight on drug pricing has forced retail pharmacies to make their offerings more attractive and competitive. One way they're doing that is by partnering with different startups to offer delivery straight to the home of the patients. These pharmacies are looking into other forms of care too. I use the CB Insights Business Social Graph to map out the investments of Walgreens and CVS since 2014, and we see some interesting activity when it comes to the promotion of care. Walgreens has made an investment in Tito Care, which provides the tools for consumers to do tests on themselves, and CVS has invested in My Health Teams, which is a social network for people with chronic disease. So both of these have clear use cases in identifying potential customers at the top of the funnel. CVS has been particularly public about their efforts to help better manage the care of their customers. Brian Tilzer, the head of their digital innovation lab, talks about wanting to create a better connected health experience for people to stay on top of their health, a clear sign that CVS is exploring opportunities outside of just selling goods. This is made doubly clear by their ramp up of their retail clinics in their pharmacies, which we talked about before. And while those companies are trying to expand the reach of their pharmacies and the services they provide, other companies like PillPack are trying to reimagine the pharmacy entirely by removing the brick and mortar aspect. The company sends medications in individualized packets by mail and coordinates refill with your doctors. What I think is really interesting about the company is that they're able to manage several different prescriptions and then turn them into individualized packets which means that they can actually help people manage complex medication schedules and attacks the problem of medication adherence. PillPack's mail pharmacy has stirred some incumbents like Express Scripts, who's a uh, one of the largest pharmaceutical benefits managers, and has had PillPack in their pharmacy network. But Express Scripts also has a competing mail order service. The mechanics of PBMs probably deserve their own webinar, but this dynamic created some obvious tension, and the two sides eventually reached a resolution as many PillPack customers voiced their complaints. As I've gone through the webinar describing changes in the existing healthcare system, I thought it would be good to wrap up the webinar by looking ahead and how care might change in the future thanks to emerging technologies, especially it directly affects the end consumer, the patient. One technology that's had quite a bit of press written about it is virtual reality. While there are a lot of consumer applications in gaming and entertainment, there's actually quite a bit of opportunity in healthcare, including teaching scenarios for doctors, such as surgery simulation, um, as well as several therapies and care which can be delivered at the patient's home. Mark Cuban recently wrote a blog post where he used virtual reality to cure a form of constant dizziness that he had. And while still in early days, there have, been there have been some preliminary research studies to suggest that virtual reality could play a role in different forms of therapies from phobias to PTSD. Here we see a study done at the University of Washington to assist with pain management. Artificial intelligence is another technology that's impacting almost every industry across the board, healthcare included. Everything from mining actionable insights from wearables which QMedic is doing to prevent falls and monitoring the movements of elderly patients, 
to confirming that you took your medicine through machine vision, which is what AI Cure is doing to tackle medication adherence. A large number of companies are working in the imaging and diagnostic space. Um, so imagine that you take a picture of something like a rash, which a computer has seen a million plus times, and then it's able to predict with reasonable accuracy what your condition is. As this problem becomes more of a search and data problem, several tech giants have made inroads in this space, including Baidu, which now has an AI-powered Ask a Doctor program. Google's DeepMind is also working with several hospitals to turn their data into methods that can scale disease identification and then theoretically scale down the cost. IBM has invested heavily into its Watson program, especially for healthcare. When we look at their acquire analytics stats on the CBI platform, we see a spike in activity in the last year, which included quite a few recent acquisitions that have been in the healthcare space, including the billion dollar plus acquisitions of Truven Health and Merge Health, and then prior to that, they acquired Explorus and Fitel. Mm -hmm. Augmented reality, which is layering a computer interface over the real world, has lots of applications outside of just playing Pokemon, including in healthcare. Some interesting proposed use cases would be to layer patient data on top of the actual patient to maintain face-to-face -face interaction, but also because some data is time sensitive, such as patient's blood type um, and allergies, in an emergent situation, uh, this becomes crucial. Another is being able to guide less skilled doctors through surgeries and other procedures. And today we're already seeing some applications like Avena, which is a headset that allows doctors and nurses to see patient veins. And so in theory, this kind of uh, technology could actually be brought closer to the patient's home. Robotics has captured the fascination of the healthcare world, with many hospitals now buying or bringing in robotic surgeries like the Da Vinci robot, which, re which received FDA approval in 2000 to do minimally evasive and complex surgeries. The number of surgeries done by robots has gone up according, according to Intuitive Surgical that owns the Da Vinci robot, um, but, these it, but these procedures are still more expensive than the non-robot assisted versions. Studies are being done to assess the mortality rates and quality of life increases thanks to these surgeries. But in the future, we can imagine that these, uh, as these robotics become more automated, the cost of doing the procedures will end up going down. Among other robots, several companies are experimenting using drones as a means of delivering critical care, especially in rural areas. Both Matternet and Zipline are starting in Africa, where delivery is a bigger issue, and regulations around drone flying are still more lax. And this is important because even in the US, many ambulances don't reach where they need to be in an acceptable time frame. Here we see some don't even reach within 30 minutes, which can change a life or death scenario. Uber is also being looked at as, po as a potential solution with fleets of drivers already spread out across cities, which could provide quicker care to patients should they need it. Though obviously regulations around this are still being worked out. And finally, there's 3D printing, which has already made significant progress in healthcare. 3D printing can affect many different parts of the healthcare system, from making more customized prosthetics and splints, to more specific dosing of medicine for patients, to faster prototyping for devices. All of this can happen closer to the point of care and really helps to embody the idea of personalized care that's prevalent in the healthcare industry today. And so that's about uh, wraps up the webinar. I hope that you guys found this in some way helpful, and I know there's a lot I didn't get to, um, but we're going to use the remaining time we have to field some questions. And if I don't have a chance to answer your question now, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or email me at nkrishnan at cbinsights.com. Are pharmaceutical companies investing in any of the companies you mentioned today? Are there digital health startups targeting them? Pharma companies, with the exception of a handful like Merck and I think Roche, um, have actually had pretty little involvement in the, dig the digital health space. Um, we have a, blog, a post on our blog with a more detailed analysis, but for the most part, um, pharma companies are typically investing in private markets, usually as a means to outsource the R&D to smaller biotech and drug companies, which are working some of the more experimental and out there treatments. But there are definitely digital health uh, opportunities for pharma. Some of the AI companies on the market map I had up earlier are uh, working to improve drug development. Um, there are companies that are making the R&D process more, more mechanical and therefore uh, more reproducible. 
And there are a lot of companies that are powering a lot of the more um, complex data analyses that are required for pharma. How can small companies afford to self-insure? Wouldn't a high medical bill still bankrupt the company? So more health insurance companies are starting to offer what's called stop loss insurance. And that's effectively where a business pays a premium, um, a smaller one than the one they'd pay for full insurance. Um, and they pay that premium so that if for some reason the medical bills go astronomically high and um, you know, break through some predetermined ceiling, the health insurance company will cover the costs after that point. This is a way for health insurance companies to not fully lose the revenue streams from uh, people that are planning to self-assure. And it's probably one of the developments that's also made more of the small and mid-sized companies feel comfortable about um, insuring themselves. For larger firms like the health insurance companies you mentioned, are they more inclined to acquire, partner, or invest in digital health startups? How do they decide? Um, so as someone who you know is not on the inside, obviously I take everything I can say with a grain of salt, but I think it definitely just depends on the strategy a company wants to take, and it's definitely different on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, in health insurance, for example, I know Humana has its own venture arm to invest in companies, um, and I know it's invested in Omada Health. Sometimes investments might make more sense, especially if the data stream from the company is valuable. Uh, partnerships can be a useful way to provide more offerings to customers, like the telemedicine partnerships we talked about before, or it might funnel more pe more cus potential customers through the pipeline into the insurance companies. If the services or the data set are particularly valuable, a company might purchase it to keep it proprietary for them, um, and sometimes they'll just acquire companies that are in the same space so they can uh, hold market share. Is there an area of healthcare, digital health, that you think is underinvested right now? Um, I think there are quite a few areas. Personally, I think that companies that are focusing on the Medicare and 65 plus age cohorts are particularly important because the most of the majority of healthcare costs are actually rooted in that population, and most of them have conditions that can actually be managed remotely and then significantly reduce hospitalizations. So we're seeing some companies like Honor and Home Team, but I think that the companies that are focused on the Medicare market itself rather than trying to expand into the Medicare market are going to have an easier time since um, Medicare operates pretty differently. Um, so that's all the time we have for today. If there are any questions I didn't get to, please feel free to email me at nkrishnan at cbinsights.com. Uh, and I'm going to pass the speaking over to Riley again. Okay, thanks everyone again for joining us today. As a reminder, we'll be sending out the slides and the recording, so look out for that in your inbox. We'll also do our best to reach out and answer any questions we didn't get a chance to address here today. And don't forget, we're also a software company with the most comprehensive platform to help you draw your own business-specific insights about what's happening in the private markets. Let us know if you want to take a look, and have a good day, everyone.